Hello, good people, good evening, good evening, good evening. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God is good. Uh, coming to you live again. Uh, just making sure our audio is coming through. And we're about to do another installment here. Um, if you are seeing me, say hello. Tag your friends, tell them we are back on air. I know that I was not able to come on last Sunday, and even today has been a challenge getting here, but here we are. Like promised, I am here, and we trust that the Lord will help us through this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I bless you, I worship you, I give you honor, I give you praise. Thank you for your grace to come on air today. Thank you for your mercy and your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. You are the Lord who keeps us. You are the Lord who sustains us, O oh God, by the power of your word. And as we get into your word today, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will minister to us. I pray that we will find renewal and strength in you. We will find hope. We will find um, encouragement in our lives. Lord, I pray that um, even those who will come to this message much later on, that your word will still be fresh and powerful in their lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, good people. Bless the name of Jesus. Thank you. I see you, Sister Sylvia. God bless you for being on air with me. And um, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, we are still on our series, Walking by Faith. Today is part 23. And we are talking about Samson. He's quite a character. We covered him two weekends ago. And so today is installment number two on this wonderful character in the Word of God. Um, last time when we uh, talked about him, we basically introduced him, how he was born and his parents and his calling upon his life. And we got quite a bit into the Nazarite consecration for him and even for us today. And so as we move right along, we know that he's a man that was called of God to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines who were oppressing them, plundering them, and basically killing them. And he uh, was a Nazarite from conception. His mother was given specific instructions on how to raise this boy. And as he came of age, he was taught the things that he was supposed to do and how to maintain his consecration to the Lord. And so as we continue with him today, uh, being part two, and we might have two more or so lessons on Samson, um, today I want to get a little bit into, dive a little bit into his mistakes. So uh, uh, having been called of God, anointed of God, for a special assignment, um, he didn't walk the straight and narrow all the days of his life. And so he begins um, on a dangerous uh, uh, path, but we will see later on that God redeems him and helps him. Nonetheless, I don't want to spoil the story too much, but today I want us to, to begin to address some of the mistakes he made along the way. Um, so as, as the story continues, remember he's in the book of Judges. The story is in the book of Judges, chapter, um, chapter uh, 13, 14, and 15. So he, he will pick up today from chapter 14, verse 5, and I've got the, the lessons there for us. Um, Judges 14, 5 and 6. The word of God says, So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. He tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat though he had nothing in his hand. But he did so, but he did not let his father and his mother 
uh, uh, he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. That is Judges 14, 5 and verse 6. So uh, this young man, Samson, he has come of age. He's beginning to feel the uh, starring of the Spirit of God upon his life. He also has his own ambitions. He wants to get married. And so he's been looking around among the young women of his day, and he spots a woman in Timnah, and he says, I want to go marry that one. His father says, couldn't you find somebody from among the Israelites? Nonetheless, he says, that's the one I want. And so he begins to go down there to pay this woman a visit, her family a visit. And one day as he's going there, a lion comes charging at him. And he has nothing in hand to fight or defend himself with. And so he feels the spirit of God come upon him. He gathers this mighty divine strength and he tears and rips apart this lion as if he was doing that to a goat. That speaks volumes about the might and the strength that Samson had. Physically, of course, but we know this is divinely inspired. And then we go down to Judges 14, verse 7 and, uh, through 10, and it says, Then he went down and talked with the woman. This, we're not told the woman's name. We're told she's a woman of Timnah. That's all we know about this woman, a woman of Timnah. And so he goes down, talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he, went, when he came to his father and mother, he gave some of them, I mean some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there, for young men used to do so. So Samson happens to go down to Timnah again a different day. And he's walking down, and then he notices, oh, the other day when I killed the lion, I threw the carcass over there, and he notices there is a swarm of bees on the lion's carcass. Interestingly, there is honey there. And he reaches out and he grabs some of that honey and he eats as he goes along towards the woman of Timnah. And then finally he also gets up with, catches up with his parents and gives some of the honey to them. But he also doesn't tell them where he got the honey from. In the meantime, the wedding arrangements are happening and they are planning to throw a feast and he'll have his bachelor friends over for a bachelor's party before he marries this woman of Timnah. What I want us to learn from this portion, and it'll be very brief today, but we're beginning to look at Samson's mistakes. The thing that begins to derail him in some measure and limit him from his calling. He knows he is a Nazarite. He knows he is supposed to be consecrated to God. He knows that there are things he is not supposed to do. For instance, he is not supposed to cut the hair, the locks of hair on his head. That he knows. He also knows that he is not supposed to take anything fermented like alcohol or fermented milk or whatever. He also knows, as he has been taught, like we covered in the first installment, he is not to come anywhere close to a dead body, human or beast. He is not supposed to touch it. He's not supposed to come close to it because that would render him unclean and defile him from his calling. Right here as we see, not only did he make a mistake picking uh, 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 or starting to consider women outside of Israel, although we know from previous reading that this was God's occasion to begin his work to avenge Israel of, of, of the Philistines. 
So I know in my heart of hearts, reading the word of God, that ultimately God was not going to let Samson marry a foreigner. It was a setup, a setup, an occasion to begin his assignment. It was never meant to reach consummation. His marriage to the woman of Timnah was never going to reach consummation according to the law of God and the purposes of God. Nonetheless, it was a divine setup as God intended to. To him is the wisdom. I do not understand why he chose to do it that way, but I understand there are certain principles of the word of God that God himself will not violate. And we gave an example of Abraham when God tells him, go sacrifice your only son, Isaac. We know from the principle of, of the word of God, the principles of the word of God, and from the very nature and character of God, that not was God going to allow Abraham to actually kill his son. It was simply a testing of his faith. And so even here, we might as well say God is also testing Samson to see if he's really willing to carry on the plans and purposes of God. But according to the principles of the word of God and the nature and character of God, Samson was not going to consummate his marriage to the woman of Timnah. Amen. Nonetheless, the mistake that Samson makes that begins to compromise his calling is number one. Hallelujah. He kills a lion with his bare hands. That makes him, brings him into proximity with a dead animal because he just killed it. What was he supposed to do? He was supposed to disclose this to his parents because the word of God says he did not tell his parents. And then he goes a second time and looks around and he sees honey in the carcass of the lion. And he reaches out, touches it, draws some of it, eats some of it, gives some of it to his parents. And once again, he does not disclose to his parents that he has been in contact with a dead animal, with a dead body. So Samson, you are beginning to compromise your calling. You are beginning to compromise your Nazarite consecration. You are getting close to deadness. That is a violation of your consecration. Now let me ask us, servants of God, children of God, what is it that God has told us to abstain from and we keep getting close to it. Like Samson, it is going to compromise our consecration. There, there are things that we know from the word of God that we are not to get into proximity with. We are not to engage with. We are not to have closeness with. And yet, oftentimes we will do. It is the beginning of a fall. It is the beginning of a slippery slope into defeat and despair. It is the beginning of falling into sin. This is what's happening to Samson here. He does not disclose. The word of God says in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13, he who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. You see, there is no redemption in covering our sin. There is no prosperity in concealing our sin. When I have sinned against the Lord, I have to bring that thing into the light. I have to bring that thing into the light of the word of God and the light of the presence of God. I have to disclose it if I'm going to prosper. And that doesn't mean you go around telling the whole city what you've done. It simply means you need to go to that person of authority, divine authority in your life, and discuss this thing with them. Just like Samson needed to do this, 
with the, with the priest of his house, his father, with the prophet of his house, his mother, so do we today need to disclose our sin, the things that we have gotten close to that we shouldn't have. Is it, is it, is it, and, and the simple things are, you know, sexual sin, you know, infidelity in marriage for those who, who are married like I am, you know, financial uh, things. Th those are the easy things. But sometimes they are luminal things. The hatred in your heart, the, s the evil thoughts that you have about someone, you need to bring those things in the light. It is one thing to pray in your private. But if you're struggling with that thing and it keeps coming over and over, you need to have some accountability in your life and bring it to light to your pastor. Maybe if you're married to your spouse, you need to have a discussion and disclose that thing to the people that have divine authority in your life, people that have a priestly mandate over your life, people that have a prophetic mandate and action over your life. When we conceal our sins, like Samson is doing here, we start on a slippery slope. We're going to find ourselves in despair. We're going to find ourselves in a place of deeper compromise, contrary to what God wants us to be. He wants us to live a victorious life. And, and the word says that, that when we keep going back to these things, you know, think about it. Samson killed the lion one day. Another time he comes around, he's looking around for the dead lion. Come on, Samson. You killed these things. Why are you going back to them? And that's often what we do in our Christian walk. There are things we have mortified, as the book of Timothy says, mortify certain things in our, the, the, the works of the flesh and the desires thereof. There are things that when Christ called us, we killed them. We crucified them on the cross with Jesus. And somehow we've been walking with the Lord five years, ten years, and now we're looking back to go back to them. We killed them. Yesterday, why in the world are we going back to them? You killed the lion yesterday, Samson. Why are you looking for honey in the dead lion? I know some of the things that we used to do before we came to Christ might have been sweet, might have been pleasant, might have been wonderful. But that was before we knew the truth. Now that we know the truth, there cannot be anything better than Jesus. There cannot be anything sweeter than Jesus. There cannot be anything more beautiful than fellowship with Jesus. When we find ourselves longing for those things of the past, retreating to look among the dead elements of our lives, looking for honey in the carcasses of our past, it's a slippery slope. Those are the mistakes we make. That is one of the mistakes as a believer you can make to start going back to things you consider sweet from the past. That's what captured Samson's heart. He knew he had killed a lion. He comes back a different day. What in the world are you doing with a carcass? What in the world are we doing with the old rose that was crucified when I came to Christ? What in the world am I doing looking for honey in the carcass of my past? The word of God says in Proverbs 26 and verse 11, As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. When we go back to the things that Christ has modified in our lives, it's as if we are a dog going back to our vomit. How gross. How gross. E. God help us. In Peter, 2 Peter, verse two, I mean chapter 2, verse 22, it says, But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow, uh, having washed to her wallowing in the mire. That, that's what, that is the description of someone going back to their past. 
That is the description of someone retreating and returning to the old lifestyle. And I know I, I have to say this in our day to day. You know, you know, it's sad. It's sad to say that some of us have become cold in our walk with the Lord and we think that we're missing out somehow. The things we forsook. You know, when your friends would take you to the bar, when your friends would take you to the honky-tonk places, you know, for example, when, 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 your, when your grandmother would take you to the witches and the wizards, and, and somehow we want to go back to that. It's as, it's, it's, it's as if a dog is returning to his vomit. It's as if a pig, having been washed, now is going back to roll in the dirt again. It, 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 is, it is the word of God says, as, as, as sets up Samson as an example. When we do those things, they are mistakes that will begin to desecrate us from our Nazarite consecration, as it were. They are things that would derail us from our calling and our assignment, as the word of God uh, uh, tells. So mistake number one Samson makes, he conceals his sin. He doesn't bring it to the light. Number two, he goes back to the dead things of his past, getting close to a dead body, the things that we're supposed to have nothing to do with, he goes back to them. He's like a dog going back to his vomit. He's like a pig having been washed, going back to roll in the mud. And as I conclude, I say today will be very short and I'm, I'm done. Uh, we'll pick up God willing next Sunday with part three on Samson. Again, we'll talk about his mistakes, uh, handle another uh, 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 um, um, facet of the mistakes that he made in his calling. What I want us to do today is just ta take some time and, and reflect. Reflect on our calling in Jesus. Reflect on how the Lord has called us out of darkness into light. Reflect on the fact that we as believers also have a Nazarite consecration. Remember like we covered last time, Romans 12 verse 1 and, and through 2. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Uh, uh, that, that is Timothy. Actually, what I want is Romans 12, 1, verse Verse 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that uh, what, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is, like I said last time we, we were here, this is our Nazarite consecration. We are called with a holy calling. We are called to be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. We are called to be transformed from the world, to be different from the world, to be different than the systems of this world, to fulfill, to know and to fulfill the will of God and the calling of God upon our lives. In that calling, we cannot hide sin in our lives. If there is anything within us, we need to reflect on that. And if there is anything about us and within us that is desecrating us from this calling, from this Nazarite consecration, we need to bring it to the light. We need to confess our sin. Is it 1 John 1 and 9 that says that when we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us and he's, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is a cleansing that needs to happen in our lives from all unrighteousness. Glory to God. Glory to God. So we cannot conceal anything in our lives. If there is an area of struggle, bring it to the light, to the person that has priestly mandate over you, to the person that has prophetic mandate over you. 
Uncover your sin. Bring it to the light. Do not conceal anything that you may prosper. Amen. And, and secondly, the things that we have mortified, the things that we have crucified, the things that we have killed, I beseech you, let's not go back to them. Hallelujah. The Bible says, let him who sinned, sin no more. Let him who lied, lie no more. Let him who did X, Y, Z, do X, Y, Z no more. That is the word of God. We need to live a consecrated life. We have a high calling. We have a Nazarite consecration to our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop with that. Father, in the holy and mighty name of Jesus, we bless you. We worship you. Thank you for this lesson today. As we go, Lord, I pray, help us to reflect on our calling in Jesus. Reflect, O oh God, and contemplate in our lives the things that we are compromising on. And begin to repent, begin to turn away from them, begin to bring them to the light that we may prosper in you. Lord, I pray that you will keep us by the power of your word. Thank you for your word. Let it live in us because it is alive. Let it quicken us to holiness and righteousness in you, Lord. We thank you. We bless you. And Father, even for schools, as we begin the school year this year, I want to thank you, Lord, for all the students. I want to thank you for the children. I want to thank you for college students. Father, I commit all of them to you, praying for your peace over their minds, praying for their safety in the schools, oh God. I pray for their teachers. I pray for the administration. I pray for all the ancillary and support staff. Be with them, oh God. Give them the wisdom they need to educate and train our children in godly ways. Father, I pray that the will of the enemy will not prosper, but the purposes of God will prosper in the land in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Those who are traveling, I commit their journeys to you. Lord God, those who are at home, those who are sick, I pray that you touch them in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you because you are faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, dear ones. I will see you, God willing, next Sunday again. Bye-bye for now. Amen.